Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. I've really got a fantastic guest today, Catherine Duncan. We're going to talk about this point where you reach something and it's like, is this all there is? You know, uh, something's missing. You know, I've worked this hard. Now what? She's going to talk all about this feeling. We're going to talk about opening your heart and soul, feeling alive. Um, and it's going to be a fantastic conversation. Uh, Catherine, welcome. Thank you for having me on. Great to meet you. Yeah, you're actually doing a really interesting work um, with clients. You're an author, you're a thought leader, but you know, kind of talk about your journey. You you left a lucrative job uh, with time, and then you kind of went down this rabbit hole. So kind of talk about that story. I was working in advertising for years right out, out of college, and then I worked for Time Magazine the last 10 years of my advertising career, and it was fun. I enjoyed meeting <laughs> people, and it was lucrative and successful and fun. And the glamour of it, everything about it was super fun. But about five, six, seven years into my position with Time Magazine, I just started to feel this nudging, like, oh, this wasn't quite maybe where I'm being called, even though on the outside, I was making money and flying on Time's corporate jet and all this. But my heart was feeling restless. And I had actually thought I wanted to be, my dream was, oh, I was going to be a manager for Time Time Warner, for Time Magazine. And I actually, um, they had me write a business plan. They gave me the job. And I couldn't say the words, yes. They just couldn't come out of my mouth. It was so strange. And I said the word, no, and was like, who am I now? Where am I being called? And this led to, within a few years, um, I actually had a near-death experience on a Time Inc. corporate trip in Costa Rica, whitewater rafting. And I'll tell you, that was a turning point because after that trip, I just thought I need to take a break to kind of sense and feel and listen to where I'm being called. And I left. And that's what started me on the path of then studying theology and to this day where I am. Oh, very Fascinating story. I, you know, I have the same story. You know, I I, I love med school. I, you know, I, I had kind of like this storybook career, and then kind of 2008 hit, and I and I was like, you know, I saw all this corporate, you know, greed and fraud, and I was like, I don't want to work for this system. And I had the same exact feelings as you. I think 2020, everybody felt the same way. And then so kind of talk about. So one thing is, um, you know, this nudging and the calling, and and I think it's growing more into the human collective consciousness it's like you see a, a lot of rich people really unhappy but you see you know kind of people you know using money you know or different resources so kind of talk about this dichotomy this reaching the pinnacle and then it's like like you look at um michael phelps you know however 20 plus gold medals and he's like suffering from depression and kind of talk about that what I learned personally and and professionally, I, I I did leave the corporate job. I ended up studying theology, divinity. I became an ordained minister, a board certified chaplain. And I what did I become? A chaplain in our level one trauma hospital and a hospice chaplain, which was incredible experience. And then I left that to start my own private practice, which I have now called Learning to Live. I'm an integrative spiritual consultant, but I'll I learned personally that, yeah, having having money, gosh, it does open doors. It makes life easier. Yes. And, and so grateful the years, you know, I experienced that with particularly in Time Warner days. Um, but it doesn't fill your heart and soul. It doesn't bring you that deep, deep inner peace. Um, and I also am reminded of this in my daily practice. I work with many executives, attorneys, doctors who um, come to me and I work with them one-on-one -on -one providing emotional, spiritual support. And they may have a you know incredible career and have done really well, and maybe they've made millions, but they're just their heart. There's a restlessness. There's just a not quite a connection. There's a lack of maybe it's feeling lonely. Maybe it's feeling some sadness or just there isn't that deep joy. And our work together is, well, we're a healthy, integrated person, mind, body, spirit. And if you're just living in your mind, which we use our mind, of course, for work and planning and organizing, but if you live your whole life in your mind, you're not feeling, you're not in your heart and your soul, where that is where that deep peace and ease and joy and aliveness. And 
I help many people come into their heart and soul to feel the joy of just being alive. I love that. And, you know, a lot of this audience, you know, they've spent decades training, uh, taking care of patients, uh, building businesses. <clears throat> and somewhere along the lines, let's say they listen to this podcast and they're like, yeah, this is exactly what I'm feeling. You know, I need to, I need to uh, make the leap. It kind of allay their fears about, man, I spent 15 years training or I you know, got into this much debt to, for my education. Uh, how do you address those concerns? <laughs> And I think people and I, many people I work with that are executives, whatever profession, they continue to work as executives, but they're able to <clears throat> drop into the moment, to this sense of deep presence where it's when we're in the present moment, not in our fast chatter ego mind, when we can have moments of presence where we can like, oh, here I am. And there's that peace and that ease in that moment. Um, so you can continue in your practice, but meeting yourself, coming into yourself, feeling your essence. I mean, we know that we know we can watch what we think and we can watch what we feel. We're that stillness, that witnessing presence behind that. And when you start to open into that and grow that sense of grounding and presence, not only is it so healing for ourselves, but then we can share that with everyone. I mean, so we can only, I truly believe, we can only meet another person if, you know, if our profession is a doctor or an executive or an attorney, we can only meet another to the extent that we've met ourselves. So it's about first starting with ourselves and how do we feel that vibrant aliveness where we can feel that peace and ease within, and then we can meet another on that path. Uh, what if, you know, for example, um, we have a lot of uh, legacy listeners, their dad was a famous doctor or attorney, and, and then they're like, yeah, son, you're gonna, you're gonna follow in my footsteps. And you know, your son, you know, etc. Like, and they realize they're on the wrong path, but they've spent a lot of time. And so how do you address those concerns? And I have witnessed this internally with my family and mm -hmm. also professionally with many people. I think until we can carve out every one of us, <clears throat> and it's a decision and it's a choice, every one of us who's listening to this right now is making, are you creating more space to open and grow or are you living on autopilot? And that's a choice. And but if you can create a little space to just have some moments of presence, some moments of you're walking outside, you come by a lake and there's some moments of like, oh, wonderment and presence, we can tune in and we can sense, feel, hear guidance. Every single one of us is guided, but we have to create some stillness, some space to hear it. And that is a daily practice. It's something I practice every day religiously it's part of my life so i think when we can have every one of us some moments of stillness some presence we can hear where we're being guided we all have a unique path and it may end up not being what our father did or what okay you're going to be a doctor or you're going to be this but we're all here for a reason and it's tuning in and feeling into and getting a sense of yes this is why i'm here and it's there for every one of us Mm -hmm. I love that. And then moving on, because we talk about you talk about self regulation, self compassion, and what are some effective strategies for self regulating the nervous system growing self compassion, especially during these stressful times? Well, here's the exciting news. Every one of us can self regulate our nervous system. And it's a practice. So even I, I start with people and talk about awareness, like where are you? Where are you all day long? Are you, it's building that awareness muscle. Can you notice, huh, I just spent the last four hours, I'm just in my mind. I'm just my mind, I'm living head up and I'm just in my mind. <laughs> Can I take a break for a minute or two for moments of presence to breathe? We know that five minutes of just doing a breath exercise, um, breathe, you know, you can put your hands on your heart and breathe, feeling the coolness of the air coming in as you breathe in, the warmth as you breathe out, just feeling the warmth of our hands on our body. When we practice 
five minutes of doing a breath exercise, meditation, physiologically, it lowers our blood pressure, our heart rate, our cortisol level. It's called the relaxation response. Dr. Herbert Benson from Harvard in 1970, revolutionary, coined this term. It's now really accepted by all medical systems nationwide, but exciting to know that if you can tune in and notice, oh, I'm kind of stressed, I'm kind of anxious, if it's a breath, a uh, meditation, a body movement, working with just your senses. And in my new book, Everyday Awakening, I have 42 exercises to help you tune into how can I bring some calmness and peace and regulate my nervous system. Yeah, I love that. Um, especially, you know, in this whole idea of nervous system regulation and kind of nervous system downregulating kind of... Um, activating your parasympathetics as opposed yeah. to the um but then this what's interesting is you have an interesting take as you talk about role of neuroplasticity in awakening and you mentioning use of neuroplasticity exercises in your work how do these exercises aid in awakening one's true nature i think the whole study and research on neuroplasticity is fascinating for so long it was understood or people thought, oh, our, our brains and minds were just set. Well, now we know that's not true. What we think and what we feel in our environment is shaping our brain all day long until the day we die. So I've been studying neuroplasticity models. I'm certified in a few. And I'll tell you, um, of every model I've studied, there are four basic steps that are how you can, every one of us can rewire our brain. Uh, would you like to hear the four steps? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure the <laughs> listeners would love to hear it. <laughs> so it's so easy for all of us. I do this too, where all of a sudden something happens and you start in a worry or a rumination or anxious. It's just, we call it like a limbic loop. You're stuck in a negative thinking pattern. Well, the more you keep worrying or keep ruminating or keep having this anxious thought, it's strengthening that neural pathway in your brain. So the four steps for rewiring your brain are this. Number one, can you just identify what, what where am I? What's happening? Mm, I'm worrying about, this is hypothetical, but let's say I'm worrying about what uh, some family member said to me a couple of days ago. So when you can name what that worry, that rumination, that anxious thought, that research shows calms your nervous system. Number two, can you identify the feeling? Not always easy. Sometimes it's hard. And I've learned and I've practiced and practiced like, what am I feeling? But can you tune in and notice what you're feeling? And if you can hold curiosity, when you're curious, you're in a parasympathetic state. So can you notice, hmm, what am I feeling? Mm, I'm feeling a little anxious right now. When you can identify the feeling, it calms your nervous system. Number three, can you feel the feeling just for a little bit? And here's the thing, emotions are not permanent. But when we feel them, they start to move through us and dissipate. And that is the pathway to healing is moving through and feeling your feelings. Can you feel them for a few minutes? Just breathe into whatever, let's say that anxious thought is, just breathe into it to let it. And I promise you, it will start to dissipate. It will not run your life. It will start to lessen. And the fourth step is growing the good. Uh, I've worked with um, Rick Hansen on his neuroplasticity model. I'm certified in that. I love his phrase, grow the good. So what does that mean? The fourth step a positive affirmation. Like here's an example. In this moment, I'm okay. I'm strong. I'm resilient. Another is a positive image that just warms your heart. We're just like, oh, it feels so good. So I'll think of my five-year-old dog, Bella, and I think of Bella, <laughs> and my heart just warms. And you just sit with that, that positive thought image and just marinate in the good. And so what that's doing is it's creating positive new neural pathways in your brain. And that's just a quick takeaway how every one of us can work at how is our brain wired and wiring it to the positive. Yeah, I, I love that. And it's kind of like just basically building new uh, pathways and new habits, ways of perceiving things. Um, I love your, you know, these rumination thought patterns. Um, 
and so kind of talk about you know we kind of have a few more minutes um and then as someone who counsels high profile pro professionals such as you know, attorneys doctors you know what common challenges do they face in awakening their heart and soul um what advice do you often give for professionals seeking more I would say the first step, and this is actually the first, I have my, my book, Everyday Awakening, Five Practices for Living Fully and Coming Into Your Heart and Soul. The very first practice is coming back to the present moment. So even just practicing a minute, a two minute, few minutes here and there during the day where, you know, you take a break, you've been working, let's say for three hours, two, three hours, and you take a break and you go to the bathroom. <laughs> You can walk into the bathroom. Can you just be in your body? Feel the floor supporting your body. Feel the energy moving your body. Feel the strength in your legs. Brings you into the moment. Even while I'm talking right now, can you feel your hands? Just feel your hands. Feel your fingers. What's there? Whatever's there. When you do that, when you take a moment and you feel your hands, your fingers, your mind can't think at the same time. It just brings you down. Another example I love, I've done for years, is you put your hands over your heart area and you just breathe. This just starts to calm your nervous system. Breathe. Uh -huh. Feel the warmth of your hands. Focus on your breath coming in and out. And then you could add a loving kindness phrase, you know, may I be at peace, or if you believe in something beyond, you know, give me peace and just breathe. Mm. So these are just little examples I share with many people I work with and every single one of us right now listening to this. For some people, breath exercises might speak to you or meditation or maybe somatic body movement or, you know, walking in nature, using your senses. It just Noticing what gives you a little breathing room, what helps you take a break, feel down into your body, into the moment, and grow that, and growing love. I think the biggest takeaway is I think we're here to learn to love. I think what we take with us, and I was a chaplain at hospice with hundreds of people, and that was the number one theme I heard is people wanted love at the end of life. That's it. And I think we can grow that love in our heart. And I share that with my clients. And I think when we die, that's what we take with us, our ability to love. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I just love your um, your presence and kind of slowing down. How can people uh, contact you, um, follow you? Um, if they want to learn more about integrating spirituality in everyday life, check out your social media, et cetera. Yep, yep. My... My book is called Everyday Awakening. Uh, I have a copy right here. Here's what it looks like. Woo! I'm on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. I'm over, it launched nationwide in July. You could go to everydayawakening.com. And then I'm also on Facebook my as my business name, Learning to Live, Catherine Duncan, Instagram, LinkedIn. So love to hear from anyone. And um, yeah, it's been delightful talking with you. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. And for all the audience out there, let's thank Catherine for coming on, uh, giving us a lot of practices that we can use in our in daily lives to become more spiritual, integrated, whole. Uh, be sure to check out her book on Amazon, leave a five-star review, follow mm -hmm. her on all, all of her socials. These links will be in the um, show notes. And with that, thanks so much for coming on to the podcast. Thank you. Blessings.